What's up, everybody? I'm Jesse from Plant the Spear, and thank you for tuning in to this episode. Uh, this is going to be our post-early signing day and recruiting recap show, so I hope you guys enjoy it. I have some things that I'm excited to share with you on here, some graphics that I made uh, for this episode. It was actually my original early signing day edits, but I decided to go in a different direction, uh, but I thought they would make uh, they would work good for this video. Uh, actually, it, man, it's just a crazy, hectic week and leading up to yesterday. I think I made over 50 edits in the last week, so it's been pretty busy and it was exciting. You know, Florida State wasted no time hitting the ground running uh, with multiple commitments before 8 a.m. yesterday. So just with everything that was going on, I was going to do this video last night, but it was going to be late and I was pretty tired because I'd worked the night before. So I wanted to wait till today so I could get everything in order for you guys, because if you you know, if you know me and you know this channel, you know, I prioritize quality over quantity and being on the spot or in the minute uh, with, with that. So with that being said, we're going to talk about uh, just some of the things that we like from this class, some of the players that they're bringing in and just take a look at the classes as, as a whole. Uh, so to start with a couple of things that I want to talk about before we get into it. And first off, that's how recruiting has changed in college football with the addition of the transfer portal. And the reason I say that is because a lot of people tend to look at Florida State's class ranking and which is 20th currently. And they say, well, that's not good enough. You know what I mean? That's not that's not going to cut it at a place like Florida State. And look, I'll be the first to admit Florida State does have to get a little better at high school recruiting. But I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be, because when you factor in what they're able to do in the portal by getting quality day one starters who are plug and play ready to go. I think it's okay to have a balance between the two. You know, different teams and different programs are going to be in different positions when it comes to recruiting. You know, you're going to have a team like Miami who has been in a 25 year rebuild and maybe isn't as good as they thought they were going to be. So it's okay for them to try and buy players from the high school ranks to build for down the road. You know, I understand too that a program like Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, they have a they have recruited a high enough level. They don't really have to hit the portal. So the thing is, when you look at Florida State, Florida State is kind of in a weird position where you have enough returning veteran talent that you have a real chance to make a run next year at a conference title, at a playoff appearance, you know, maybe even a national title. Who knows? Um, but when you have something like that, it it's important to remember that. You need to, you, you almost have to approach your roster management like an NFL team. You know, if you have enough players where you feel like you can make a Super Bowl run right now, then you don't go out and sign a bunch of rookies. You go out and get veteran players who can contribute right now and make that run. Because what's the ultimate goal? To have the number one class or to win games and put a ring on your finger? You know, that's the point. And that's what Florida State's trying to do in 2023. They're pushing their chips into the middle for 2023 while still trying to build for the future. Because that's not to say you can just completely blow off high school recruiting or that it's not important. But it has changed. I don't think it's as crucial anymore. And the reason I say that is because when you look at high school recruiting and what you are able to get, like, let's say you have a five star guy, unless it's at wide receiver or defensive back or something like that, it's not often that they're going to contribute right away. And it's not also that common that they're going to stay for all four years. So realistically, if you have a high end recruit, you're probably only going to get two real years out of them anyway, maybe three tops. Well, Florida state's got, you know, we're getting two years out of Johnny Wilson, two years out of Trey Benson. You know, you're getting two years, three years out of a lot of your transfers. So to me, I don't see it as a downside. I think you can, reduce some of the shortcomings in high school recruitings as far as bus and things like that by evaluating kids based on college film against college competition. So you don't have to worry about, you know, this guy didn't play in a great high school region or this guy didn't have great teammates. So maybe he doesn't look as good, you know, or whatever. They're harder to evaluate. I think you get a more fair evaluation and you also get a player who's been in a college level strength and conditioning and nutrition program for at least a year. So you get more of a ready-made player who can contribute right now while while also bridging the gap for the future while the young players that you're getting have time to 
develop and, and wait until they're ready. You don't have to force them into action. And so I do think the portal has changed the way recruiting is done. And I think that's important to remember when you look at how this class shapes up for Florida State. You know, because again, when you talk about building a roster, to me, it's not always about chasing the highest star rating. It's not about having the highest ranked class. It's about finding players who fill and address needs on your roster who fit your system, fit your culture, who want to be there. And that is, to me, more important than the star rating beside your name, especially with NIL involved, where some of these may just be a lot of it about money. And so I do like what Florida State's doing. I do like their approach for recruiting now by using – by being willing to go into the portal, by being one of the staffs who is adapting with the times and willing to go into the portal to get guys that can contribute right now and also allow some of the young players that we're excited about to develop. Because I do feel like Florida State has a good core nucleus of young talent. It's just some of those guys need to be developed and not forced into the into playing too early, which is something we've seen in the past that can that can ruin guys. Uh, so that's just something, like I said, when you, when you see number 20 by the rank in their class, don't get discouraged. Like there's still a lot of pieces in this class that I'm excited about. And I do think that they got some really good guys. You know, of course you lost one player and it is what it is. And, and, and do keep in mind guys, like we're not here to bash anybody. It's their decision to go to whatever college they want to go to. There were a lot of dreams fulfilled by these kids. Yesterday, you know, it's an exciting day for them, an exciting time for them. And I'm not here to judge them for picking a different college than the one I cheer for. Uh, it's it's a bigger picture than that. So kids are going to come. Kids are going to go. There's no guarantee that Keldrick Falk is even going to be on Auburn's roster in two years or that he would have been on yours. So, you know, who's to say that if Auburn wasn't a dumpster fire a few, you know, the, the last few years that he was even at Florida State, committed to Florida State. And it's also a player at a position who you already have two guys that I'm excited about that signed yesterday. So uh, it's an unfortunate loss. I'm not trying to just play it off like it's nothing, but it is what it is. Like that's, that's part of recruiting. You were able to hold on to literally everyone else. So I do think it was a successful day for Florida state and an exciting day as you get to meet uh, the future of your program and welcome in a lot of new Knowles to the Florida state family. So uh, we're going to start by the overall class and just taking a look at them. So Florida state does bring in 23 total players, 16 from the high school ranks and seven transfers, including Keziah Holmes, who is already on campus. Uh, but because he transferred so late in the year, he goes to the 2023 class. So I have on here class ranking of 19th. It was updated after I made this, this uh, to 20th third in the ACC. So again, you're still top three in your conference. And, you know, we understand that one of the teams ahead of you, if it wasn't for a billionaire booster, probably wouldn't be ahead of you in, in the rankings there. So, you know, and to be honest, that's fine. They can do that. If that system they think is going to work for them, have fun because I don't feel it's sustainable. I don't feel you, know, you, you have the edge in coaching. And so like, if there's one program, I'm not overly worried about stocking the roster it's Miami because I still think you're you'll be okay there but uh anyway so their transfer class is second and and the reason I bring that up even is because Florida State right now is at a point where they're trying to get back on top of the conference they're trying to take back the ACC and we've seen the play on the field catch up but now you know we got to see the recruiting take over too because you know to catch Clemson you are going to need to get some high-end guys there uh but again, Florida State is making up that ground. And the success that they had on the field this year isn't going to pay a whole lot of dividends with 2023. That's going to be more where you see 24 and 25 because you haven't had time to sell that. The relationships that you're building with the class of 2023 was when you were asking people to come in and help get Florida State back to where it was. They just also happened to you know kind of be along for the ride once the success already hit. But now that you can walk into a living room and you can say, look, we won nine regular season games, maybe a 10th game. You know, maybe Mike Norvell walks into a living room next year uh, with, with an ACC championship ring on his finger or something like that. Like that is going to pay dividends going forward. And that's why you see Florida state has a top five class in 2024. So looking at the high school recruits for Florida state, you know, some guy, you have five-star wide receiver, Hakeem Williams, four-star offensive lineman, Lucas Simmons. You get Blake Nicholson, who's a four-star linebacker, uh, Keith Sampson Jr., a player I'm excited about, Lamont Green Jr. You know, you see all these names, and they have some really good names here. When you look at the the transfer uh, ranks, you have Keziah Holmes, Keandre Jones, uh, Jaheim Bell, Daryl Jackson, Casey Roddick, 
Jeremiah Byers and Kyle Morlock, all guys who look to be day one contributors for you. So there's a lot here that I'm excited about. And when you talk about transfer portal versus high school recruiting, and we're going to get into Tribe 23 in just a second, we're going to go player by player and just I'm going to share some of my notes on them, some of the guys I'm excited about and, and things like that. But one of the things people always bring up a uh, address or a question to me is, do you think that this is just sustainable by going through the portal? And I do think, first off, I think there's not enough data because a lot of people like to say it's not sustainable before they even know the answer to that. And to me, I just don't think the portal has been around long enough for you to be able to say that. Because when you look at what the portal has been able to do, like if, if you look at the two paths that people like to say are unsustainable, one of them is leaning to the portal. And one of them is overpaying to get these high school recruits now that NIL is available. And to me, I think the the way Mike Norvell and Florida State has went about it, when you compare it to a program like Texas A&M, to me, this model seems more sustainable. Not only did you take your program from three and six to nine, potentially 10 and three, by leaning on the portal, by getting these transfers, a lot of these guys also return and they, you know, you saw them want to play for each other. They want, they know what's on the cusp in 2023 for Florida state. And they want to be a part of that. And that's another issue that's been raised to me is, well, how does the culture work when you're bringing in a bunch of transfers and the transfer portal, I feel like gets an unfair uh, kind of rap of being a bunch of bad guys, problem guys who are maybe looking for a fresh start at a new program. And that's not necessarily the case. You have a lot of good guys who are just looking for a different opportunity for various reasons. And so you, that comes back to what I was just talking about, where look at Texas A&M. Now, I don't know if they bought their recruits. Nick Saban sure does seem to think so. And, you know, Jimbo got awfully defensive about it, but it's likely. And so when you look at what they were able to do to get those classes and, and bring in those, you know, high priced recruits or whatever you want to call them. Now you went from nine and four in Jimbo's first year down to five and seven and half your team's in the portal. So to me, what looks more sustainable and what looks like a better path as far as developing culture. To me, I don't see an issue with these portal guys. I don't see that because they've already had that one stop. They realize this, this next stop has to work for them. They have to make that work. And so, you know, they're more about their business when they recruit, they're not worried about taking pictures in a rented Lambo on the field and, and all the NIL does and stuff. They want to know more what you can do for me and what I can do for you, which is what we saw when it, with Jermaine Johnson. And so I do think that that is something that I just wanted to address real quick that I don't have an issue with the way the approach that the staff is taking to build their roster. You know, they manage it for the short term and the long term, and they are so big on guys that fit their, you know, their culture and their system and want to be at Florida State that, you know, we saw how bad it was when there was a broken culture at Florida State. And so. To me, it, it, there's more to it than just star chasing and, and getting the highest ranked recruit because you can have the highest ranked class at the end of the year. That's fine. But I'd rather be the highest ranked team at the end of the year because that's what matters more. And, you know, you could like say Miami finishes with a top five class and half their players hit the portal like they did in Texas A&M. All that was for nothing. And how long are these you know rich boosters going to keep spending their money on guys who might not stay because you don't get a guarantee with that? So to me, again, like I said, that is something that I just want to discuss because the transfer portal does change the game a little bit. I mean, when you look at what Florida State got out of the portal this year, you know, you landed uh, two of the top three tight ends who are going to be day one impact players for you. You landed uh, the number two offensive tackle who was a conference, all conference first team player at UTEP. You landed the number five interior offensive lineman who has 30 starts at the power five level. You uh, landed the number 18 offensive tackle who has 22 starts in the SEC West. So you're able to get guys who are able to come in right now and make a difference. And to me, I'm okay with that because if you feel like a staff can evaluate, and I believe this staff can, if they can evaluate and find those gems, then it's okay for me to go and, and you know, have them evaluate players based on what they're seeing on college level film and even at the high school ranks. You know, if they feel like a three star or a four star who fits their needs and fills a need for them, and, you know, and fits what they're trying to do is what I'm looking for. And they work better than, say, a five star recruit who's only looking for a bag. Man, I'm OK with that. Like, I think that is a better recipe 
for uh, for success than the other way around. So, you know, again, to me, I, I think they did really good with this class. Um, Norvell said in his presser that they were able to hit most of their top targets uh, at, at many positions. So they were able to get the guys that they felt fit their system and were going to fill those needs for them. So they hit on a lot of the players that they wanted, which is good to hear. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to focus on what they didn't get and, and you know, make videos about, you know, are we going to get Travis Hunter and things like that? Like, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm not here to talk about Keldrick Falk and Travis Hunter. I'm here to talk about the players we did get because that's who I'm excited about. That's who's on the roster. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but again, like I said, the culture pays so many dividends going forward because another thing Mike Norvell mentioned was how the players that are currently on this roster – when he would go to do recruiting visits in home, the players he's recruiting would talk about players who are currently in the locker room were recruiting them, telling them why they need to come here. And if you want a perfect example of why transfer portal doesn't kill your culture, Maury, this is and this is an example that Norvell brought up when when Maury Smith was their starting center and they brought in Caden Lyles to essentially take his job. Maury Smith was his host on campus. So like you hosted the guy who's coming in trying to take your job, but you know, it's competition breeds excellence. And if you're scared of competition, you don't really belong on a football field anyway. So I don't think that this is an issue. Uh, you know, I think it's when you see them able to load up multiple offensive linemen, I think it's just everybody, you know, they want to come in and compete and they want to be part of a team. And I think that that speaks to what they've been able to build uh, build at Florida State. And, and then, like I said, you still have a good core of young talent that you're building. So, you know, you're able to address the right now and the future. So I do like that mixture there. So, um, again, just when you take things in whole, like the, the big offensive line class they got last year and some of the other players that they got, and you look at who they got this year, and then you look at the, the class they're building in 2024, I think when you combine it all together, I think there's plenty of reason to be excited about the players that they do have and the players that they're getting. You know, you you have absolutely stocked the trenches, especially on offense. And when's the last time we've been able to be this excited about the offensive line at Florida State? I mean, Alex Atkins is a miracle worker, and I hope he loves living in Tallahassee and wants to retire here because we need to keep him around for as long as we possibly can because, you know, this guy, when he gets on someone, it is over. You know, it is that is his guy. So um, I do love what they're doing on the offensive line there. And you also, you know, we went so many years without getting a high school quarterback, and now they've been able to put a few together where you have A.J. Duffy last year, you bring in Brock Glenn this year, and you also have Croman Hawk next year. So you have – three good quarterbacks. You have your future at the position coming in. You're also got some good running backs coming in. We're already excited about Rodney Hill. We know that you get Sam Singleton in this class. And then you have Cam Davis coming in 2024. Who's a five-star player. You know, the high school uh, wide receiver recruiting at Florida state has lacked a little bit, but they've been able to kind of make up for that in the portal. But now you get a few good guys that you're really excited about in a Hakeem Williams, uh, in a Vandravius Jacobs, and in a Goldie Lawrence, you've got got you're starting to fill that base now. And so even Mike Norvell mentioned they're not taking a transfer wide receiver this year. And, you know, I don't know if that's maybe because they think they're going to add Destin Hill or not. We're just going to wait and see on that. I don't know that I believe that yet, uh, but whatever. We'll see. I hope so. I hope so. Um, but, you know, they have done the job that they needed to do to pick up at certain positions through either way. So I do, I still, I don't think high school recruiting is as bad as some people think. Now, obviously, like I said, it, it could get a little better. Uh, but anyway, so before we get into Tribe 22, and that's right around the corner, there is one, one example I found that I wanted to share with you guys of why chasing a high rank star doesn't always matter. That doesn't mean getting a five-star player, he's not going to be as good as a gym three-star. That's not the case. Like if you can get, five stars. You got to get them. I mean, it's just, it's football. Uh, but it doesn't always mean you're going to get that level five-star level production, you know, more than an, a, another guy just because they have a higher star rating. And the example I found for that, that I, I think you're going to find interesting here is let's look at the running game, the running backs, should I say for Alabama versus Florida state last year. So Alabama hit the portal and got Jameer Gibbs from Georgia Tech, a guy that everybody knew was already a talented running back, number one running back in the transfer portal last year. So you had a guy who's essentially a five-star in the portal. 
He had already had 1,200 yards, uh, over 1,200 yards of rushing and eight touchdowns in two years at Georgia Tech, who, you know, Georgia Tech is abysmal. So, you know, you have a really talented player that they were able to go pick up. You put that player behind an offensive line made up of two three-stars, two four-stars, and a five-star. And he competed against only one top 50 rushing defense last season for Alabama because their schedule is pretty soft. Uh, but Jameer Gibbs last year, who's your uh, quintessential five-star running back out of the portal, 136 attempts, 850 yards, 6.3 yards per carry average, and seven touchdowns. He had 35 missed tackles forced and 23 runs of 10-plus yards with a PFF grade of 80.2. Now, when you look at Trey Benson, who was the 40th ranked uh, running back in the portal the same year as Gibbs, a guy that had only produced 22 yards at Oregon due to injury, only one touchdown. And it was a pretty catastrophic knee injury for running back. So a lot of people even gave Mike Norvell grief for even bringing him in. But their talent evaluation told them that if this guy's able to, you know, if he's able to re recover from this knee injury, he's something special and we want to take a chance on him. So they did. And now when you look at Trey Benson last year, he competed or he ran behind an offensive line that was made up of all five three-star players. So not quite the star ranking that Alabama has up front. He also competed against five top 50 rushing defenses. So four more than they did at Alabama. And you also had another one of the rushing defenses that was sitting right there at 52. So last year, Trey Benson had 141 carries for 969 yards, averaging 6.9 yards per carry and nine touchdowns on the ground. He had an absolute insane number of 77 missed tackles forced, 30 runs of 10 plus yards and a PFF grade of 91.2, all while splitting carries with two other talented backs. So that's a great example, guys, of why you don't always have to land the five star guys to get five star production, because this is this is living proof right here of, of where you can take a little bit of an underrated gem and turn them into that five star production, that five star talent. And so that's why I'm excited about the talent evaluation that the staff is able to do. And that's why I'm so excited about the pieces that they're able to get. And so with that said, we're going to go ahead and get into Tribe 23 and go player by player and just kind of talk about some notes that I have on each one. Uh, before we get started, I will say that the height and weight on some of these guys will vary. It depends on where you pull it from. Uh, most of the ones that I'm going to say uh, speak is going to be the updated uh, thing. Some of the graphics may be you know, a little different either way. Uh, you guys get the point of that. But uh, this is also the original edit that I made for National Signing Day. It was kind of a theme thing. So I'm excited to share it with you guys. But, you know, Mike Norvell coins the system built for playmakers. And so, you know, I kind of tried to come up with something for like uh, trading cards, sports cards or something like that. It's kind of a hot item now. And so this is my Tri-23 Playmaker Pack. And we're going to start with the crown jewel of the class. And that is Hakeem Williams. So he comes in five-star wide receiver out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, standing at six foot three, 215 pounds. And he is the number three wide receiver in the 2023 class. And this is a guy that is, he has the tools who to be able to contribute day one. And Mike Novell addressed that. He said, you're going to, trust me, you're going to see Hiking Williams on the field next year. And so this was a huge gift for Florida State to, you know, there was a lot of talk, and he even addressed this, Hakeem did, where Mario Cristobal was blowing his phone up. You know, he I think he even got called from Dion and things like that. You know, a lot of people were trying to steal him away from Florida State at, at the last hour, and he stayed firm with Florida State, which is it's exciting. And you know, he may be my favorite Seminole now, just because after he signed, he said, you know, there there's no Travis Hunter over here. You know, I'm here to work and I'm here for Florida State. So that was just kind of an awesome little statement there, kind of a, a little thorn in the side at the end, uh, throw a little rub a little dirt on him. So I do love, uh, I just love his attitude and I love what he brings to the table. Uh, so he is a dual sport athlete who's got both the size and all the tools you want in a receiver. And, you know, he projects to be an NFL guy someday. And again, like this is a guy that not only are you going to get to contribute from day one, but you know, the next probably two to three years, 
you're going to have a really high end wide receiver in Hakeem Williams. So again, super excited about what you get from Hakeem there uh, at the receiver position. So up next, we're going to go to one of the most exciting recruits to me when you look at the future, and that's Lucas Simmons. Now we already know they were able to stack this uh, the the line of scrimmage on offense with the previous classes, but Lucas Simmons is one of the to me one of the highest upside guys that you've been able to bring in in the past few years. And when you look at his build, he's a four-star offensive tackle who comes in at six foot seven, two hundred and ninety-five pounds, tenth-rated overall tackle at the position. He's still new to playing American football. It's only been a few years. He he grew up in Stockholm, Sweden. And really didn't get interested in uh, football until later in in his high school years because of his size. He was naturally drawn to that, and he's built like a true offensive tackle. Six foot seven, long legs, long arms. He's got a huge wingspan. So this is a guy that he's going to have to develop. You you probably won't see him for the next year, maybe even two, because he's still learning the game of American football. But if you've only been playing a couple of years and you're already a high rated four star, that just goes to tell you what his ceiling can be and what people see in him already. So this was another big get for Florida state. And of course, Alex Atkins. And so this is a player I'm really excited about that. Once he gets developed can be a multi-year starter for you with NFL potential. And, you know, when you say offensive lineman, Florida state and NFL in the same sentence, it almost sounds like, you're just making stuff up, but I mean, it's, we finally are getting some guys, you know, with Armella and, and Lucas Simmons, like you, you, you got some guys up front that to really be excited about. So Lucas Simmons is uh, again, a player that I'm really looking forward to seeing in Garnet and gold uh, up next is Blake Nicholson on the defensive side could be the offensive side as well. Uh, he is a four-star linebacker out of California, a uh, six foot two, 215 pounds. And the reason I say both sides is he, Blake is a excellent, versatile athlete. He plays both ways for his high school team. And, I, you know, he realistically had more impressive stats on offense than he did defense. I mean, this dude does it all for them. I can't quote the numbers right now uh, without trying to pull them up. But I want to say it was something over like 2,000 all-purpose yards last season alone. So, you know, this is the guy that will be able to contribute on both sides of the ball. He did mention throughout his recruitment that Mike Norvell mentioned he can get him the ball as well. He can get him involved on offense, you know, like we saw with DJ Lundy in some goal line packages. So I think this is a guy you'll can see uh, you'll see contribute on both sides. But again, you have a good quality linebacker here. He looks like a linebacker. He's built like a linebacker. He plays physical and he has good speed. So, you know, this is another player that I'm excited about to build around the future. You already have you know, a, a good linebacker in Omar Graham Jr. that you were able to bring in last year. So I do think the future of the position is looking good with Blake Nicholson there. Now, obviously, you'll probably need to add some more because you're going to lose some guys after this year. Uh, but this was a really good one to bring in. And, you know, now with you bringing back Tatum Bethune and, and Kalen Deloach, that you – He'll be able to see some, he'll be able to get experience this year, but you won't have to rely on that young talent, which is another reason why I always say that I love the portal because now you don't have to rely on those young players in a pressure situation when you're trying to make a run for the ACC or for the playoffs. You're able to let those guys get in, you know, in some garbage time or, you know, or whatever. Or if they, if you just, if they're so like Azaria Thomas, if they're so good, you can't keep them off the field, you can go ahead and get them in there. But, you don't have to rely on freshman mistakes, which we did see out of them sometimes uh, this year. So excited about what Blake brings to the table and keeping it on the defensive side. Up next, we have Keith Sampson Jr., defensive lineman, four star out of New Bern, North Carolina, six foot three, 285 pounds. He's an underrated player, in my opinion. North Carolina 4A defensive player of the year moves very well for his size. Uh, he has a good motor and plays physical. And, you know, I'm going like I read a bunch of recruiting profiles and I watched some huddles and stuff like that to come up with my notes on these players. Um, so th this is my take on, on everybody here. So I, I don't always have the inside track, you know, but I, I always keep that real with you guys about. I just try and provide my own authentic coverage here. Uh, but anyway, so this is a 247 top 200 player with NFL potential who. If you get Fabian Lovett back, I don't think he has to be a contributor year one, but you can get him some experience. Now, we did see last year where, due to injury, Florida State had to get into their depth chart on the defensive line a little bit. You know, so you have some young guys with experience, and you have a player like 
Ayabami Tafasi, like Josh Farmer. Uh, you have some of those guys that are going to be ready to go this year. And if you get Fabian Lovett back, and I have a good feeling that you will, that you this is the guy you can let develop, but then next year you're going to need him. And I think he's going to be a good player for you. I think he's going to be someone that can take that position of like, you know, a Fabian Lovett or a Robert Cooper or something like that. So you have a big guy who moves well, and I'm excited. You know, he was the seventh overall defensive tackle in the 2023 class. Up next, we have Lamont Green Jr., a.k.a. Boots. And most of you are going to be familiar with the name. Obviously, he comes from a good bloodline. Uh, Lamont Green, his father played at Florida State back in the day. So this was a legacy recruit that was, I'm so glad Florida State was able to keep him on board. He is an edge defender, six foot three, 228 pounds currently, a four star prospect uh, or four star signee out of Miami. And he's got a good get off, good length, and good bend. He had a dominant. Uh, senior season off the edge with 20 sacks. So this is a, a real productive high school player that I think is going to translate well uh, for Florida State. Now, obviously, we're still waiting on the news of Jared Verse. And you also have Patrick Payton, who's turned into a really good player. And so when you look at some of the guys on the roster, if they do make the decision to come back, then maybe you don't have to lean on him like he did Patrick Payton this year. But I think that this is a guy who's going to be able to contribute for you. I mean, he is a talented, uh, a talented player. And so if verse say does come back, but then, you know, he's going to be gone next year, or if he does leave and you do have to see him on the field, this is a guy that I think even as a freshman can make an impact, but you know, again, you get a year or so down the road, this is going to be a, a good player for you. Uh, so coming up next back to the offensive side, we're going to talk about Vandravius Jacobs, Four-star wide receiver out of Vero Beach, Florida, six foot, hundred and seventy pounds. Uh, he is the number forty-one uh, receiver in the class. So the thing that comes to first comes to mind with uh, Jacobs for me is speed. This is a guy who can take the top off of defenses, which is something Florida State has not really had in the past. That's why you bring in a guy like Deuce Span, who had a quiet year last year and is still in this room. Like this receiver room, again, it's pretty stacked. It's pretty deep with Winston Wright and Deuce Span and all these guys that are coming back. So, you know, I think it was okay for Florida State to look more in the high school ranks than the transfer at this position. You have to approach your roster on a position by position basis. Do we need help now or do we need help in the future? Receiver is something you don't need help now. You need help in the receiver, but you also get guy or in the future. But you also have guys that can help in the future, too. So, again, uh, Vandravius Jacobs can take the top off of defense. He has really good hands, and there may be some development there. Uh, but, you know, with that development, he can be a really special player for you. So, next up, we have Sam Singleton here at running back. He is a four-star back out of Orange Park, Florida. Number 22 running back in the class, 5'11", 180. And he's a was a very productive running back from Florida in high school, averaged 7.2 yards per carry over his first three seasons. He also carried offers from LSU and Tennessee. So, you know, he was a highly coveted prospect by some SEC teams. And to be perfectly honest with you, anybody that comes in at running back that this staff brings in, I'm excited about because they have shown the ability to just stockpile good backs, you know, and then when you put a guy uh, you know, a talented back behind the offensive line that they're building, that's even more recipe for success. So I'm, again, I'm excited about uh, Sam coming in. Now, obviously, he, you may not see a whole lot of production from him right away because you have a very deep running back room. Uh, but again, you know, this is a guy that with him and Cam Davis and, and the guys of the future, this is the future of your program. And he is a, a guy to be excited about. Up next, we have Edwin Joseph, who is a really good get for Florida State. He comes in as an athlete. He plays both ways in high school, so he's qualified more as an athlete. I'm not 100% sure how they're going to use him, but they may use him on both sides. Who knows? Uh, he is a four-star prospect out of Hollywood, Florida, or excuse me, signing. I keep saying prospect, but they're already signed now. So uh, number 12 athlete at the position, six foot, 182 pounds. Like I said, he played both ways at wide receiver and at corner. He has good ball skills, and he's really good at using his hands, also changing directions. This is a guy who's talented enough that he could play on both sides of the ball at the college level. So, you know, you can kind of pick your poison here. Like, wh which way do you want to use him? And I think the fact that you get a guy who's a high-end athlete that if you have some shortcomings in the secondary, you can move him over there. If you have some guys, some attrition happen after this year at the wide receiver position and you feel like you need him there, 
you can put you can put him there. So he he's this is a guy who's going to be a contributor potentially on one or both sides of the ball in the future. So this is the guy that I'm excited about. Big four star pickup out of Florida. Uh, so the next player we're going to talk about is obviously one of the most important positions on the field, and that's at quarterback. And Florida State brings in four star quarterback Brock Glenn from Memphis, Tennessee. Six foot two, 195 pounds. This is a guy that Mike Norvell had a relationship with for a while. Being from Memphis, you know, they they got on him. This was the guy that they kind of risked losing Chris Parson over, and they did. Uh, and then you ended up losing him to Ohio State, which didn't feel good at first, but it, you know, it does speak well to his talent level that a, a program who's at the top of college football right now, or or at least towards the top anyway, in Ohio State was gonna take him. It wasn't just an offer, it was a committable offer, it was a take. And so you were able to flip him back to Florida State. So credit to the staff for staying on him. He was an Elite 11 finalist invite. And the things that, that for me, when you look at Brock Glenn, he has a good ability to read defenses. He has a nice release and gets the ball out quick. You know, and he can also move. I think he was like 4740, somewhere in that range. He had 443 yards rushing in high school last season. You know, and one thing I hear I heard about Glenn was that some of his receivers in high school this year just weren't that great. And that could have hurt some of his rankings a little bit, some of his production. And again, that's one of the problems that I talk about in with high school versus portal recruiting is sometimes it can be hard to get a true evaluation on a guy based on who's around him, who he, the tools he has to work with. Uh, but you know, he's really good. They say, you know, from what I understand, he needs to work on the deep ball a little bit. Uh, but he does, he's really good at short intermediate passing. It's just, like I said, he didn't have a whole lot of receiver talent this year, but Brock is a, is a good quarterback, you know, and, and now you got him. And like I said, you got Luke Cromanhawk coming next year who can really spin it. So you feel good about that position. Now there's can only be so many guys on the roster. So you may see someone hit the portal at some point. Uh, but obviously, like I said, I do like what they get here in Brock Glenn. So up next is going to be Kenton Kirkland. Four-star defensive back out of Jacksonville, Florida, Reigns High School, which is you know means he played against good competition in high school, which is always good to help evaluate a player. Six foot two, hundred and eighty-seven pounds. That's the updated weight uh, versus the one you're seeing on the graphic. So number forty-seven overall at the position. This, when you look at Kenton, he's a long physical defensive back that attacks at the line of scrimmage. He played a lot of press man coverage in high school, which fits really well with what Florida State is able to, you know, the kind of defense that they run. Florida State likes to run press man, you know, and put their put their corners out on that island. And Fuller likes to trust his guys to work. So he fits well with the scheme that Florida State runs. And he also hasn't even really been playing defensive back that long, which is something to keep in mind. So there will be some development left, you know, before he's ready to contribute. But he only started playing defensive back in 10th grade. In 11th grade, he had 12 PBUs in 10 games, which is nuts. So, like, if you're new to the position, playing against good competition, and you're already have playing at a high level like that, this guy has a high upside for me. And, you know, this may be someone that, with a, like I said, with a few years or a year or so of development at the college level, he can be a really impact defensive back for you. So, like I said, this is another good get for Florida State played against good competition and you know he runs track as well so you know those are always really exceptional athletes and lots of speed which is what you like because uh, you can't coach speed so that's that's a good thing uh, for Florida State. a good pickup for Florida State up next back on offense you have three-star wide receiver Goldie Lawrence out of Sanford Florida uh, wide receiver six foot two 190 pounds I like the size on Goldie here six foot two you know you get that taller receiver uh, kind of gives you a balance, a mixture of size. And I'm I'm always a fan of having a, a couple of bigger wide receivers, uh, some bigger tar uh, targets. So he was productive in high school out of Central Florida. He played against tough competition. So again, that that bodes well uh, for when they get to the high school or excuse me, the college level. He was previously committed to Florida. So not only do you kind of get to steal one from your, you know, from your in-state rival, which that all that happened before the coaching change. Uh, but you also get a good player too. Now he's a good route runner, and uh, like we said, he has good size at six foot two, one ninety. His junior year—I I didn't see senior year stats—but his junior year, he caught fifty-four passes for seven hundred and eighty-two yards and eleven receiving touchdowns. I'll take that all day long. So <laughs> I mean, that if you can translate those numbers to college, you know, I'll take that. 
10 times out of 10. Up next, we're going to talk about a Juco signee, Jaden Jones. This is a edge defender who has good size at 6'6", 240 pounds. So he is currently ranked as a three-star, and he was playing at Hutchinson Community College last year, which, you know, if you know anything about Juco football, Hutchinson is kind of like the Alabama of Juco. I mean, that's a really good program up there. Now, unfortunately, from what Mike Norvell said, he did have an injury that kind of hampered what he was able to do last year in his development. And also there may be some rehab needed before he can contribute. But, you know, this was a player that he has good size and he's quick off the line and the staff was able to evaluate him in person. So you feel like they're confident in what they're getting in him, being they were able to see him, you know, in person and know truly what they're getting from him. And coming from the JUCO ranks, he should be more able to contribute right away. Uh, He was the number three JUCO D lineman in the 2023 class, so plenty of reason to be excited about Jaden Jones. You know, this may be one of the gems of the class here. And like I said, if you were going to lose a guy, why not let it be at a position where you already had two commits that or two signees that you feel really good about, and and that's Lamont Green Jr. and Jaden Jones. So. Up next, we're going to talk about Quindarius Jones, you know, keeping it kind of with with one of the gym type of uh, feels here for a player. This is a guy that came in three star athlete, uh, 6'3", 180 pounds from Meridian, Mississippi. Now, they discovered uh, Quindarius at one of their elite camps. And when he showed up to that camp, he had zero stars. He really didn't have a whole lot of offers. No one was really giving him a look. But they got him on campus. They saw what he was able to do in person, and they saw enough that they were like, it's time to jump on this guy. Let's not wait. Because sometimes when you're a program who is on the come up, you have to be able to trust your evaluation skills and get in early on a guy to get the edge over the other programs who you know are going to offer later down the line. You know, a lot of times once you see a program like Florida State offer, that that star ranking and those and those other offers from Power Five schools are going to come right after that. And so this was someone that Marcus Woodson, being from Mississippi, was able to get in on, had a, was able to build that relationship, and they were able to land him. So he does play both ways at defensive back and wide receiver. Uh, so he's a good athlete. He's got good size at 6'3", 180, and he has really good speed. Like when I watched his huddle, he looks like a burner on film. Like his speed stands out. So I'm excited about this one. A little bit of an underrated player here, I feel like now – you're probably going to hear me say I'm excited about everybody, and that's because I am. Uh, because I, I, you know, it's always exciting to bring in new players because you never know what they can do. Uh, so up next is Jabril Rawls out of Pensacola, Florida, three-star defensive back, six foot two, 175 pounds. Plays both ways again. All these guys play both ways, so they're you're getting a lot of exceptional athletes here. But not only does he play both ways for his high school team, he also plays special teams too. When you see his film, he had uh, multiple punt returns for touchdowns. He was also out there blocking kicks. So you're getting a guy who's versatile here. One thing that stood out to me on film was his length. He is tall. Like I know he's only six, two, but he looks tall on film. So like he's got size and that plays well into his ability to high point a ball, which is another thing that stood out to me on his huddle film on offense. He's able to go up over a smaller defensive back and take the ball away from them. And on defense, you know, there was multiple instances where he's able to get a pass breakup by just being able to get up and high point the ball better than the receiver. Also, he got I saw a few interceptions where he did the same thing. He just got in front of the receiver and was able to high point the ball. So he's also a physical player that seems to really enjoy contact. I mean, he liked to lay the wood out there when you watched his tape. Now, he's a little slim for 6'2 at 175. So, you you know, this may be a development player where you need to get him a year in you know, maybe even two in a high school or excuse me, a a collegiate strength and conditioning program, let him work with storms for a year or two, uh, get some mass on him. And then you'll get a contributor somewhere down the line there. But uh, again, plenty of reason to be excited about what he brings to the table. One of the most interesting prospects is, or, or signing, I keep saying prospects. I don't know why, but one of the, one of the most interesting new Seminoles uh, that we're going to talk about is offensive lineman, Chris Otto. Now, this had to be a fun recruitment for Alex Atkins, and I believe he even made the comment about it, uh, getting to go to Key West, (laughs) because that's where Otto comes from. You know, what better what better way to be like, hey, Mike, I'm going to I'm going to go see uh, this recruit down in Key West for a couple of days. Like that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, So I'm a little envious of Atkins there, but six foot five, two hundred ninety pounds and. 
this is going to be a hidden gem here. This is one of the biggest hidden gems to me in this class. Good size at six foot five, 290. He is a physical player. When I watched his tape, if you were looking for him, just look for the defender who's on their back, and chances are he's right there. Because he put almost uh, almost every single play clip I watched, he put someone on their back. Now, I know it's a highlight clip. I get that. But this guy was an absolute pancake factory in high school. Now, one thing I did hear was or that, I, from what I understand anyway, was that he didn't play against the best competition on a consistent basis. So there may be a little bit left there with, with seeing how he translates over to uh, the college level, but this is probably more of a development project anyway that you're going to see probably about two years down the road. But again, he was also good at climbing to the next level. So he's able to move, he's got good size, and he's a physical player. The thing that stands out about Chris Otto probably more than anything is his intelligence and how smart this kid is. When you can carry an offer from Stanford and Princeton, you are a high intelligence guy, which is very important on the offensive line and learning your assignments and, and knowing what to do. So I'm excited about what he can bring to the table. Uh, like I said, you're probably going to need some development there, but this is a guy who, to me, in the future can certainly be a contributor. You know, when you look at – you're bringing in this guy and you're bringing in uh, – Lucas Simmons. And so th this is the future of your offensive line. And I really like Chris Otto. I, he was a late addition to the class, but I do think he was a good pickup for Florida State. Rounding out the high school recruits, we're going to go to a linebacker, three-star player out of Duluth, Georgia, DeMarco Ward. Good size coming in at six foot two, 210 pounds. Now he was a multi-year starter. Like before you get, before you worry about, oh, it's a three-star. This guy is a multi-year starter at linebacker on a team that plays Georgia 7A high school football. That's no slouch. Now, there's that's good competition. So he played, you know, against tough teams in high school and he was productive there as well. So multi-sport athlete also runs track and plays basketball. When I watched his tape, what stood out to me, he's strong and physical. Like he when he hits, he he hits. Now, you're going to feel it. Uh, but he's also a smart player. He's someone that wasn't faked out by a lot of run fakes or, or things like that. He was able to read screens and, and able to, you know, he's just, he has very good instincts at the linebacker position. So that's something that I was excited about when I watched his tape. It's like, man, this guy, he's always around the ball. And so I think he does bring, uh, it's a good pickup for the Knowles. And, you know, you, like I said, you already got some linebackers that you feel good about, you know, this year and next year, but this is another one of those that, that I'm really, I think, you get him a little bit of a development and then down the road, you got a good player. So now getting over to the transfer side of things. Uh, first up is four star offensive. Well, he's a four star coming out of high school, but offensive lineman Keandre Jones out of Auburn, six foot four, 340 pounds. So he's got all the size you want for an interior offensive lineman, 1598 snaps of experience. Like I said, he was a four star coming out of high school. Uh, so he was a multi-game starter in the SEC West, which is obviously tough competition. Only allowed two sacks in his entire career. That's insane. Um, and he only allowed eight pressures last season. His PFF grade for 2021 was 71.1. Now, it did drop off to 53 last season, but keep in mind, Auburn was an absolute dumpster fire. So I don't know what happened there, but you know, I'm not going to judge him just off of that. But he did one thing when I was looking through his stats that stood out in 2021, he started the games for Auburn against Georgia and Alabama. Now those are two programs that are known for being dominant in the trenches, especially on the defensive line. And in those two games combined, he allowed two pressures and no sacks. So I'm pretty excited about what this guy brings to the table and what he can fill that need which they have with Dylan Gibbons leaving and Demetri, uh, Demetri Emanuel leaving, you need help on the interior offensive line. And boom, you got it right here. So I think he's a guy that can come in and contribute day one for you uh, and be an impact player. So up next, we're going to talk about another offensive lineman that I'm really excited about. And I, when I made this edit, I love his picture. Uh, he just looks like a werewolf, you know, or a, a very angry one. Like, would you want to try and rush against that guy? Cause I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he looks like what you want from an offensive lineman, but six foot six, 290 pounds. Uh, that's an updated height and weight there comes in from UTEP. This is the number two offensive track, uh, offensive tackle in the transfer portal. 
He was a first team all conference player at UTEP and has almost 2000 snaps of experience. He only allowed four career sacks. So in over 2000 snaps, you only allowed four career or four sacks. So that's doing something. Uh, 2022 was probably one of his best years. He allowed zero sacks and only eight total pressures. And he had a PFF grade of 79.1, which is really high for an offensive lineman. So tons of reason to be excited about a guy that you get to come in and be a plug and play day one impact player uh, for this offensive line. I mean, guys, this this is the most excited I've been about an offensive line at Florida State since I can't, you know, maybe 2013 or something like that. Cause you have a, a really host of young uh, of good young guys that are coming up and we don't know if they're ready yet. That, that's something that Alex Atkins knows, but certainly a guy like Armella, you know, or, or a couple of the other guys are going to be ready to contribute soon, if not now. And now you're also adding high level transfers of that. You're not adding, you know, debt players from other schools or anything like that anymore. You're adding top level players. So again, you have to wait and see what he can do against the better competition coming from UTEP. That doesn't always translate, uh, but he did play a game. He did start a game against Oklahoma last year, not necessarily known for their defense, but still a power five program. And he only allowed one pressure in the game. So, so far, so good there. Uh, up next, keeping it on the offensive line, because Alex Atkins is just out here doing miracles. <laughs> He's bringing an offensive lineman by the dump truck load. Uh, Colorado transfer Casey Roddick. Not only a good fit for what you need and as a player, but also a good fit as a person from what the staff says. This is just a great dude who's going to be a good fit for the culture and the need on the roster here. Uh, six foot four, 305 pounds. I know Colorado wasn't a great program last year, but that doesn't mean he can't be a great player because he is the number five interior offensive line in the portal, multi year starter at the power five level with over 2,000 snaps of experience. 2022 was his best season yet in college. He only allowed one sack and six total pressures with a PFF grade of 65.3. Now, the thing is, he had a stellar pass blocking grade of 82.9. So, I mean, again, you're getting a plug and play guy who's ready to make an impact day one. So I'm excited about this, especially, you know, at first it was like I, I said in the past before they got these 2023. 2023 is going to be special, but you need to answer some questions on your offensive line and, and some some other positions. Well, it pretty much looks like your offensive line is set now. I mean, you, you got the tools, you got the position or the, the players that you need to fill those holes. Uh, so next up, we're going to talk about transfer tight end Kyle Morlock. One of the, you know, this is another big get out of the portal for Florida State. He was highly coveted. This, you know, a lot of teams were after him. Six foot seven, 250 pounds from Shorter, uh, which is a Division II school. Productive tight end, over 400 yards receiving last year and six receiving touchdowns. Two-time All-American. And his his size at 6'7 gives you another big red zone threat alongside Johnny Wilson. Number three tight end in the portal. Good get for Florida State. You know, maybe you put a few more pounds on him once it gets into a power five strength and conditioning program to help with this blocking. Uh, but you know, again, when you're looking at at making over a position, flipping a room that needed it probably most because you just haven't got much from the tight end position. And Cam's leaving, uh, Wyatt Rector's leaving. So you needed to flip that room and you did that. Uh, by adding Kyle Morlock and the next guy we're going to talk about, who is Jaheim Bell. Uh, this is probably, if not the biggest get, the best get out of the portal for Florida State this season. And a guy that I am really excited to see uh, play in Garnet and Gold next year. Technically, he's listed at a tight end, but he's a guy who can who you can use in multiple positions. Six foot three, two hundred thirty two pounds, chiseled out of stone. When you see pictures of him, so he is an exceptional athlete who moves really, really well for his size. Uh, he comes from South Carolina, so he has over 600 snaps of experience in the SEC, over 1,000 career all-purpose yards and 11 touchdowns, even though he wasn't used a lot, which is part of the reason he's transferring. He played multiple positions for South Carolina, including tight end and running back. Now, he's not the greatest blocker because he's kind of a shorter tight end, but again, that's not why Florida State brought him in. I'm really excited to see how Mike Norvell uses him in the offense next year. I think you're going to see him get the ball in a very, uh, in a multitude of creative ways. So this is a guy that's going to be an immediate impact player, and a lot of people wanted him. This was a really big get for Florida State. Trust me, a lot of, a lot of really good programs wanted to get their hands on Jaheim Bell, and it was Florida State that came out at the end. So one of the positions that Florida State needed help potentially next year because we still again we still don't know what Fabian Lovett's going to do and you know I, I lean towards he's going to come back but even then we saw with injuries last year 
you just got to get deeper on the defensive line. And that's where Daryl Jackson comes in. Uh, six foot six, 300 pounds. Now he is a transfer from Miami, but we won't hold that against him. Uh, you know, it's funny because sometimes you're like, ah, coming from Miami, but you know, I don't blame him for wanting to get out of there either. And he looks a lot better in garnet gold to begin with. So you get great size at six foot six, 300 pounds with 639 snaps of experience. Impressive PFF grade of 72.4. Uh, from last season, 16 pressures, three sacks in 2022 tackling grade and his rush defense grades were well above average. So uh, that's exciting to see. And, you know, if you get Fabian Lovett to come back, you already know you're losing Robert Cooper. But this is a guy that can that can make, again, a day one impact starter for you on the defensive line. Obviously, they're still pursuing some other guys there, uh, but this is a good get for Florida State. And he still has multiple years of eligibility uh, eligibility left. Now, he does need to get a waiver to play this year, but they do feel good about that. So. You know, Daryl Jackson was a, a good pickup for them on the defensive line. Now, at running back, the last one we're going to talk about here is Kaziah Holmes. Like we said, he's already on already on campus, already been practicing with the team, uh, but he does count as part of this class. So six foot, 211 pounds is my updated uh, height and weight here. Coming from Penn State, he was a four-star player out of high school, coming from Cocoa, Florida. Uh, the number, he was a top 200 consensus player already. And he was a top five all-purpose back. So you're getting a really good player here uh, from the portal who, you know, again, this is what I talk about. Like, just because you don't get him out of high school doesn't mean you can't land a player like this a few years later. So he's got a lot of speed and he's got a good ability being an all-purpose back and he's good at catching the ball out of the backfield. He's got a lot of ability to work in space. Now, he didn't have a whole lot of production at Penn State, but, you know, they, they were kind of stacked there and he got he got some action out after some injuries. Uh, but this is a guy that I'm still excited about coming to Florida State. PFF grade in 2021 uh, was 65.7. But again, he had limited action, but you still get a good player here. So, I mean, that running back room is absolutely stacked for next season. And so that's going to wrap it up here, guys. Just kind of going through some of my thoughts on 2023 and what they were able to pull in. And, you know, I'm really excited about this class. I think they got a lot of quality players, both from high school and the transfer portal. And I think they were able to address needs as they felt, you know, was the best the the best way for immediate success and also building the future. And, you know, because I'm sure they want to be around here for a while. So they, they're not just going to completely ignore high school recruiting. But I feel like they did a good job. I feel like it was a successful signing day for them. I don't think because you see number 20 next to the high school rankings that there's any reason to hang your head. So, um, I, you know, I'm just excited about the new crop of Seminoles and I'm excited to see what they can do for next year. And uh, so we'll wrap it up there, guys. I do appreciate you guys tuning in. And thank you for all your support. And as usual, go Knowles.